Let's stand together and let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, this morning, in a series entitled um, uh, Timeless Wisdom, a topical study through the book of Proverbs. If you're with us this morning and you don't have a Bible, just flag one of these guys coming up the aisle right now with the Bibles, and they'll put one into your hands, and you can read the Word as well as hear it. And if you don't own a Bible, make that a Bible a gift from the Lord to you today. Just a reminder that uh, this uh, tonight, Sunday nights, we go through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Currently studying the book of Acts this evening, 6 o'clock, each of you are invited. And then, as was announced, next Sunday night is going to be our Christmas night of worship. We always try to do it a little bit earlier in the Christmas season to kind of set the tone uh, for the whole season. It's a great night of uh, worshiping the Lord and special music and fellowship and refreshment as well. And it's a great time to remember to invite family members and friends and, and uh, especially those that don't know the Lord yet. Sometimes they'll come and hear uh, Christmas music and then uh, get the message and see what the Lord does with that. So a nice opportunity not only for ourselves but for others as well. And that's next Sunday night. A single verse to start us off uh, this morning, and that is uh, chapter 14, uh, verse 8. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. Let's pray together. Father, now as we move from um, speaking to you, and the service to you speaking to us. We pray that you would give us ears to hear your spirit, to hear your voice through your word. We thank you that we can build not only our eternities, but our daily lives, life this side of, of eternity, and um, to build it on something that is going to outlive the heavens and the earth, your truth, and something that is going to have the final say uh, forever and always. And so we pray that you would take the truth we'll look at today and that you take it off of the printed page and not only plant it firmly in our spirit and in our minds, but then to give it a working place in our lives that we might enjoy the fullness of the life that you have purchased for us in your Son. And we ask this in his name, in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. In this proverb by the Holy Spirit, um, Solomon uh, extols the wisdom of planning ahead uh, in life. And I was uh, very much tempted to skip this as a subject uh, for the series, and uh, I thought that maybe it, that was a truth that was virtually obvious to everyone. But what stopped me was just the sheer number of Proverbs that Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs uh, addressing this very uh, subject. So clearly it's a topic that needs addressing, uh, whether in the form of uh, hearing of the importance of planning in life uh, for the first time uh, in our lives, or whether to hear it and have it uh, reinforce in our lives what it is that we are already doing, or maybe a place that we've kind of uh, slipped from in our life and uh, uh, once uh, characterized our lives but does not now. I've made Proverbs uh, chapter 14, verse 8, the starting point and, and the foundation for our study this morning. It's wonderful in the King James, from which I read it once again. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. The word way there in the passage, it refers to the path before us. Um, it speaks about uh, the future. The word understand there speaks of examining, paying attention, understanding, to consider, to think all the way through. In other words, uh, our planning ahead in life. I think a couple of other translations are helpful to get the full impact of what it is that Solomon is trying to uh, impart to us here. 
uh, and, and I think they make it even clearer. The NIV puts it, the wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of fools is deception. The Amplified Bible is almost always helpful, uh, and uh, it certainly is in this passage in strengthening, bringing out more strongly the contrast between the first part of the verse and the uh, second half of the verse, the contrast between the prudent and the fool uh, in this regard. And so uh, in making clear that uh, living short-sightedly in life is foolish when compared to planning ahead in life. The Amplified puts it, the wisdom of the sensible is to understand his way but the foolish, uh, foolishness of short-sighted fools uh, is deceit. And so we recognize immediately that Solomon makes it clear that as human beings, we have the capacity to plan ahead in life and that we have not only with that capacity, a responsibility uh, to do so. Now, as we'll mention later, we want to make sure that uh, all of this kind of planning involves God in our lives, and so it's to be bathed in prayer and, and, uh, and to involve the leading of the Holy Spirit. Uh, our future plans are all to be submitted to the will of God and His plan for our, uh, our lives, that flexibility that God can come in and He can change our plans any time that He wants to when he has something uh, better in mind. There are some Christians who might disagree with this importance of planning and uh, thinking that all such planning for the future is unspiritual, that somehow it's an act of presumption on our part as Christians to plan concerning the future or that somehow it's a failure to live by faith in, uh, in God and, uh, and, and uh, uh, the idea that somehow it can hinder then the leading of God uh, in our lives. But we're going to see that these kind of views of planning uh, are contrary to uh, the teaching we find in Proverbs. And not only is this idea that somehow planning is unspiritual, uh, not biblical in terms of the book of Proverbs, but it is inconsistent with the very life of Jesus himself who commended planning and commended consideration uh, concerning uh, the future and certainly in counting the cost and becoming his disciples. Luke chapter 14, verse 28, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build but was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet one who comes against him with 20,000, or else uh, while uh, the other is still a great way away, he sends a delegation and asks for conditions of peace. Jesus, of course, in his incarnation and in his 33 and a half years uh, on the earth, he lived his entire life fully aware of what was the supreme uh, object of his life, the supreme picture for his life and plan for his life, and that was to provide mankind with the forgiveness of sins uh, in order that we might enter into the relationship with God that we have been uh, created uh, for. Uh, uh, Jesus speaking of it very clearly in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, but each day in that larger plan, uh, uh, Jesus was also led by the Father uh, on his way to accomplish that greater goal. I think about Mark chapter 1, verse 35 Early in the morning, Jesus having arisen a long while before daybreak, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. 
And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, let's go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. So Jesus has this larger plan for his life. He lives completely in complete obedience to that. But then he sought day by day the will of the Father for how that larger plan was to unfold on a daily basis uh, for the day coming uh, ahead for him. And he received that in prayer. In his New Testament letter, James uh, wrote condemning not planning concerning the future, uh, but living a life of godless, prayerless presumption concerning the future when he says, come now you who say tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that disappears, uh, appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, the Lord, if the Lord wills, he shall, we shall live and do this or that. But now you, uh, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting uh, is evil. And so he's condemning a godless, uh, presumptuous attitude uh, concerning uh, the future and uh, not condemning planning at all. Well, good planning is, is a starting point. It requires a goal. And so uh, nobody can plan without a goal. Uh, to plan infers that a person has a goal that they're aiming at uh, in their life, and uh, that goal requires planning in order to reach it. Otherwise, not only would planning be meaningless, it'd be impossible. Uh, I guess uh, a person uh, could plan to hit nothing or achieve nothing uh, in life, but what would be the point? Uh, that requires no planning at all uh, to, uh, to accomplish that kind of life. And so the importance of having a goal we're attempting to achieve is encapsulated in uh, the well-known uh, contemporary proverb today, and that is, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. And uh, that's uh, very true. Of course, the uh, general great goal or supreme goal in our lives as Christians is to discover uh, the will of God for our life, the plan of God for our lives, and then to, uh, to live that life. But then we have to move on to the specifics of, uh, of the planning that will be required in order to achieve that goal in our individual lives. Uh, specifics that uh, the Bible would have to be 100,000 pages long to provide us with that kind of specifics in our uh, life. And so examples uh, like uh, goals concerning what career I should choose in life. Uh, goals concerning what training and preparation will be required in my life in order to achieve those goals. Uh, there needs to be financial goals in life. Do I desire to purchase a home one day? Do I desire uh, children? Do I desire to be married? Do I have specific ministry goals? Do I want to uh, eat uh, healthier or to lose weight? Do I uh, have a, fel a relationship in my life that's important to me, but it's going to require more time and attention from me uh, than it's currently receiving in order for that relationship to be what uh, I want it to be, both for me and for them? Uh, do I want as a goal to stop a destructive habit uh, in my life or uh, to change some uh, immature or some uh, negative character in my life and on and on uh, the, the goals in life uh, can be. Again, the importance and the necessity of good planning in life is well represented in Proverbs and uh, so we return in earnest to our text. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand this way, but the folly of fools is deceit. Again, the Amplified Bible, the wisdom of the sensible is to understand or plan his way, but the foolishness of short-sighted fools is deceit. 
Now, again, since the uh, intention of Solomon is that the second half of that verse would be a sharp contrast to the first half uh, of, of that uh, verse, Solomon is, intends to contrast the person who endeavors to understand his way, that is, he thinks his path all the way through, he plans ahead in life uh, with a foolish person failing to do so, and the foolish person uh, 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 being one who believes that life can be lived just as well uh, without any planning. And so Solomon describes that kind of a view uh, as foolish. He describes such a person to be operating under the influence of a lie, uh, to be living under the influence of a deception. That word deceit can also be translated disappointment. And so uh, that is, uh, not only is it foolish not to give thought to and to plan for the future, but generally it also Uh, results in a life that is filled with disappointment uh, in comparison to the person who lives their life uh, planning their life as as God intends. I say generally uh, because as we noted earlier in our study of the book of Proverbs, while many of the Proverbs are absolute truths, uh, other of the Proverbs, they present truths that are generally true in life. And so there are some people who uh, might be able to uh, fly by the seat of their pants in life. They have no goals in life, uh, no plans to achieve any goals in their life. They land on their feet every single time. Uh, Then they come to the end of their life and they commend such a life to uh, everyone else uh, because it has resulted in such a fantastic life uh, for them, this life of happen chance, daily a happen chance. And in the book of Proverbs, Solomon acknowledges that this does happen occasionally, but that it's the overwhelming exception uh, to the rule. It is not the rule itself. It's on a par with a person uh, who smokes 20 cigars a day, uh, drinks a bottle of whiskey every day, lives to 120 years old, and, uh, and then uh, generally Uh, and then goes on uh, to commend this as a lifestyle for everyone. Uh, But uh, while it may work for one individual here and there, generally it ends in disappointment and uh, it ends in learning too late. That wasn't the way uh, to live. And uh, it may work out for one in 10 million, but what are the odds that you and I are going to be that one? And so without planning, our lives are going to be aimless, And uh, as a result, they're going to be uncontrolled and they're going to be chaotic beyond uh, what anyone can manage. So that brings us uh, to the necessity of good planning in life. And one of the reasons that good planning in life is necessary is in order not to be overcome and overwhelmed by life, especially in our modern world that we uh, live in. And so good planning is needed to bring uh, stability into our lives and uh, by bringing stability and order to large portions of our lives. And so once a portion of my life has been thought through, planned through prayerfully, a long-term plan uh, is put in place for that area of my life, then I no longer need to be thinking about it all of the time. I know that that large portion of my life is now under a, a, the umbrella of a wise plan, and then I can just allow that plan to unfold and only give it further attention uh, as it squawks or as it is needed um, in, in life. And so uh, we do with large portions of our life so that we can then have the time needed to address new problems that are always coming our way and will always come our way uh, in life and new decisions that are required of us in other parts of our life. And so life would become impossible if we didn't plan. Uh, If every day, every morning we woke up in the morning and, and, uh, uh, and I thought to myself, I now have to actively manage every single aspect 
uh, of my life and, and live my life as if every single part of my life is in play today. I mean, just the sheer amount of decision making that would be required uh, of us would be, uh, it would overwhelm us. I think it'd send us to a nervous breakdown. So we can't manage life if every part of it is out of control uh, or is in need of hourly and daily uh, attention. And so planning brings a necessary level of sanctified order to our lives. It brings a level of sanctified control to our lives. Otherwise, my life is going to be constantly controlled by my circumstances. I will have to deal with everything as an emergency. I will live my life under the tyranny uh, of, of the urgent and only dealing with what is the most urgent at the moment instead of what is the most important at the moment uh, in my life. And while every other area of my life is lining up to compete with every other area of my life to become the most urgent in my life uh, and, and to become the problem uh, that becomes the most urgent, which then leads to poor decisions, which then puts the entire cycle on steroids. But when we take the time to plan as God intends us to do, then it will leave us margins in life to address uh, the unavoidable crises that are going to occur um, in, in life. The crisis of one of our children going through a difficult time in their life. Uh, the crisis of arranging for a leaking pipe to be fixed in the house or to uh, fix it ourselves. Uh, the crisis of the landlord raising the rent or the crisis of the teacher giving uh, an extraordinary amount of homework in that class on uh, a given week. We can't control everything in life. We trust God to do that. But as we control what God intends us to control with good planning, then that leaves greater margins in our life for the crises that do occur in our lives as, as they arise. Now, some of the enemies of good planning in life include um, ignorance of Solomon's teaching here. Uh, ignorance that planning is a necessity uh, in, in life and certainly necessary to live a life of wisdom and a life that God uh, has for us. And, uh, and so, uh, as we've noticed, the, the, a lack of goals in life, it leads to an aimless life. And uh, also that just settling into a uh, into emotional decision-making. That's an enemy of planning. And so I just settled into a lifestyle of emotional uh, decision-making, crisis-driven um, uh, 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 decision-making, only addressing things in my life as they become uh, a crisis. And these are kind of the uh, enemies of good planning and life. Some Proverbs which speak to avoiding this kind of decision making in our lives. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 2, for those of you who take notes. Also, it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge, and he sins who hastens with his feet. And so, this warns us against decisions without knowledge. In other words, decisions that are devoid of premeditation or intelligence or uh, prior thought or planning. So it speaks about impulsive decisions, purely emotional decisions. And so this includes the person who has, uh, has set good goals in their life, uh, but then they haven't taken the next step of how to uh, reach those goals. And you have a whole world of people who set goals and think that setting goals is enough to achieve those goals and to not realize that that's wonderful to plan enough to set a goal, but then plans have to be made for how to reach that goal. And if I don't understand that and I don't exercise that in my life, I'm going to think all of life is against me uh, or, or, or I will become extremely uh, frustrated 
uh, in, uh, in life. And so it isn't desire alone or furious activity that uh, gets us to our goals. What gets us to our goals is careful planning. Making the same point as Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5. The plans of the diligent uh, lead surely to plenty, uh, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. And so success in achieving uh, any goal, it requires uh, wise plans. It requires avoiding hasty uh, or poorly planned decisions, doing things without any kind of uh, forethought. And in this proverb, uh, you might expect Solomon uh, as he contrasts in all of these proverbs uh, that the plans of the diligent lead surely uh, to plenty, that he would then make the enemy of that laziness as he does in so many proverbs. And of course, uh, laziness is a, 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 a sure way uh, to, to poverty, but he also reveals uh, it, making it true that a failure to plan uh, and, and haste is an enemy uh, of, of diligence. Very often a hasty person, you can see them sometimes in a workplace and they're just barking out orders in all kinds of directions and, and uh, the eight hours of their shift is just putting out one fire after another and usually a self-inflicted fire because of a lack of planning and everybody looks at him as the most diligent worker in the entire uh, company, but he isn't very often. Uh, he's just someone who fails to plan. And so everything just becomes a crisis uh, as a result. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3, the prudent man foresees evil. Uh, he sees evil ahead and he hides himself, but the simple man uh, simple pass on and are punished. And so it's a wise man who plans ahead, sees trouble coming, and, uh, and then takes practical measures now to protect himself from the dangers that he sees coming his way. And there's nothing carnal about that. Uh, in fact, the Holy Spirit instructs us to do that. It was flooding in California, and uh, as the body of waters were rising, a man was on the stoop of his house. And another man in, in a rowboat came by, and the man in the rowboat told the man on the stoop to get in and he'd save him. The man on the stoop said no, he had faith in God and he'd wait for God to save him. And the floodwaters kept rising and the man had to go then to the second floor of his house and a man in a motorboat came by and told the man in the house to get in. He had come to rescue him. And the man in the house said, no, thank you. He had perfect faith in God and would wait for God to save him. But the floodwaters kept rising. And pretty soon they were up to the man's roof and he got out on the roof. A helicopter came by, lowered a rope. The pilot shouted down to the man in the house to climb up the rope because the helicopter had been sent to rescue him. And the man in the house wouldn't get in. He told the pilot that he had faith in God and would wait for God to rescue him. And the floodwaters kept rising and the man in the house, he drowned. When he got to heaven, his faith was just shattered, and he said to St. Peter, I thought God would grant me a miracle, but he let me down. And Peter chuckled and responded, I don't know what you're complaining about. We sent you three boats and a helicopter. The importance of planning ahead in life is not an unspiritual thing to do in life. And of course, the most important planning that anybody's going to do in life is planning for death and planning for the life after death and to plan for it long before it comes, of course. And that occurs by putting my faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness uh, of my sins and to receive everlasting life now uh, before that hour comes. Now, throughout the book of Proverbs, Solomon tells us that one of the keys to good planning is to seek wise counsel uh, from others. And I'd like you to turn to Proverbs chapter 24, verse 6 in this regard. Proverbs chapter 24, uh, verse 6. For by wise counsel you will wage uh, your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. There is safety 
uh, the Holy Spirit tells us, in a multitude of counselors. And the reason there's safety in the multitude of counselors is that every single one of us has blind spots in our lives. And because we do, we have blind spots in our decision-making. And we have blind spots in our uh, planning. And so the importance of, uh, of being able to bounce something off of others who can give us a fuller perspective concerning the decision uh, that we're making. So you have some people who are very, very impulsive in life. And it's very good for such a person to involve uh, the counsel of those who in their life who are prone to go slower in terms of major decisions in life. And you've got others who are overly conservative in life. And they need the input of those that are uh, a little more pioneers by personality and see the opportunity instead of uh, only uh, the danger that lies on, on the other side of a particular decision uh, that it needs to be made. I think that most of us have either said or we've thought in the course of our lives in this regard, uh, oh, thank you, I hadn't thought uh, uh, of that. I'm so glad that I uh, talked with you. And that's bringing forth the point that there is safety in the multitude of, of counselors. Solomon doesn't tell us, you notice that there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors. He never tells us that because that depends upon the wisdom of the people that we make our counselors. But he does tell us that there's safety in uh, the multitude of counselors. In other words, whatever counsel we receive from another person, it still has to be taken to the Lord in prayer, and, and, but at least we've been made aware of uh, the broader implications of a decision that, that we're making uh, to then take those broader implications that we had never thought about now to the Lord in prayer uh, as well. And additionally, the bigger the battles or the bigger the decision, the more important it is to have the wisdom uh, of godly counselors. And uh, more of these kind of counselors uh, uh, to bounce something off of in our lives. It's one thing uh, to bounce off uh, somebody, should I do something that's uh, like this? It's a rather uh, trivial a decision or not a very far-reaching decision and you ask a couple of close friends. All of that is fine. Uh, but then these great monumental decisions in life uh, to involve a, a, a larger group of people in a larger pool of wisdom to then take to the Lord in prayer. And, and that's important. And Solomon doesn't, uh, you notice, doesn't merely say, be open to good advice but to seek good advice. And this is important because most people who uh, really possess uh, wisdom in life and possess godly wisdom in life, they will never press that upon us. They will never press that, that perspective or that wisdom uh, upon us. They will only share that wisdom as we uh, ask for it uh, from them. Uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. Without counsel, plans go awry. Uh, so uh, uh, again, uh, uh, plans can be poor and, and go sideways without uh, satisfactory counsel. But in the multitude of counselors, they are uh, established. And so the importance here as he lays out, not only seeking uh, godly counsel related to uh, big issues in life like war and this kind of thing as the other proverb speaks about, but also concerning the smaller things and the individual things uh, within, uh, within our lives. A person that's too proud to ask counsel of others or to receive uh, that counsel, we're going to live our lives filled with one unnecessary mistake after another. Have you ever known uh, a person and uh, um, personally, and uh, we all know many people in this regard, but they have absolute 
uh, unflinching, unfailing confidence in their own wisdom and in their own perspective. Uh, no need to bounce anything off of anyone else. And uh, they make one disastrous decision after another, after another, after another, and it never dents their confidence in the perfection of their wisdom. Uh, most of our major cities in the United States of America are being governed by people like this. You think at some point somebody would encounter some level of self-doubt uh, about their wisdom related to these things. But it's not just on that level. And, uh, and, and uh, all of uh, this needless damage that is done that, that could have been avoided with the help of some collective wisdom in their lives. Let me say it's an extraordinarily wise person who will also include potential critics of their plan uh, and make them a part of their counsel and uh, somebody that will pick that plan apart and not be afraid to uh, in our lives, uh, trust the relationship and the permission that we've given to them uh, to help us to see it with, with great clarity. And finally, uh, um, it, it, in terms of this point, it's important that we include among our counselors those who are closest to us uh, and, and those who uh, know us best. And not always, but oftentimes, this will be a godly parent. Uh, after all, uh, generally, who knows us better than, uh, than our parents, and especially a godly parent who is uh, takes a great interest in our lives in, in that role. Solomon rebukes a child who refuses to heed, uh, seek and heed uh, the counsel of a parent's instruction and in insights solely because that person is their parent. That checks them off uh, of the wisdom or the counsel uh, category as a candidate solely because they are uh, our parents. Solomon wrote in, fifth, uh, cha uh, in chapter 15, verse 5, a fool despises his father's instruction, but he who receives correction is prudent. Jesus himself spoke about the tragedy of failing to uh, avail oneself of this kind of, of wisdom, this tremendous resource uh, that we can have in our lives simply because we don't like what they might uh, say uh, to us. Jesus said, as many were offended at him, he responded, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. A good source uh, for counsel is someone who's further down the road and achieving a goal than we are. Uh, further down the road, uh, they've, or they've already achieved the goal, or, and they've navigated the path that we're trying to get, navigate now. They've already done it successfully. And so why not learn um, from such people, uh, from people uh, who are simply also uh, uh, better than us in certain areas in life? We may be better than them at other things. They'll come and ask for our advice or counsel on it, but others are much better at certain things than we are, and why not be able to glean uh, that, that wisdom from them? In my own personal life, in major decision-making, I always make it a point um, to bounce some plan that I have off of someone who has greater expertise or experience in that area than I do. I don't let them make the decision but I let them tell me what they understand and how they see it so that I can have it a, a fuller picture of it to then uh, pray and ask the Lord about. There's uh, hardly anything that we do as a church in terms of starting a new ministry or doing whatever it might be, except that through the years we see a church that is, uh, has uh, started what it is that we're looking to start or is doing something that we believe that we're supposed to do, and they're years down the road having successfully done that or accomplished that. 
Why not glean from that wisdom? And so a phone call will occur, or maybe a flight or a drive will occur to go and uh, glean that wisdom uh, from solid biblical ministries that are maybe 10 or 20 years down the path from where we are. Famously, someone in history has observed, history teaches us that man learns nothing from history. And, uh, and it's true. So the same mistakes are made over and over and over again in one generation after the other. But tragically, this often seems to be the case not only as an observation concerning mankind as a whole, uh, but often concerning the individual life as well. You think about how much hard-earned wisdom and counsel uh, dies uh, virtually ignored uh, within one generation of people, only for the next generation to relearn the same hard-earned wisdom and counsel in the same school of hard knocks to then be equally ignored by the generation that then follows them. And so then Solomon tells us that it's a wise person who is, determines not to learn everything in life from the school of hard knocks, or as if I'm the first person in human history that is facing a decision like this in, in, uh, in my life when it can be avoided uh, simply by seeking the godly wisdom of another. There's another uh, famous quote in the same regard. It comes from Winston Churchill. He's a little safer to quote. He said, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And, but Solomon makes clear that mankind is very, very good at coming up with these little quips and these little quotes, but not very good at heeding them. And not only not on an international level, a worldwide level, but not even on an individual level either. And so he exhorts us not to make the same mistakes ourselves. Now, obviously, God's Word provides us with the single greatest source of counsel that exists in the entire world, the wisdom and counsel uh, that is found in the Word of God. And nobody can uh, truly and successfully plan uh, in life that does not take God's Word and His instruction uh, into account in, uh, in the, uh, making it the foundation of our plans. It is, after all, God's Word. So that uh, puts it in the category of one. Solomon makes this point. You may sit there and say, this is a point that doesn't need to be made to God's people. These are obvious things. Solomon didn't think so. And so Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, there are many plans in a man's heart. That may be you today. All kinds of plans in your heart. And plans that we are moving aggressively to accomplish. We never brought them to the Word of God. Never brought them to prayer yet. There are many plans in a man's heart, and nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. Psalm 33, 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of His heart to all generations. And then finally, planning, uh, no planning can be considered good planning that doesn't include uh, prayer. Uh, to make God our ultimate counselor in life. How do you see this? When you look at it, he has no blind spots, zero. How do you see this? And, and uh, certainly uh, concerning individual plans in our lives that are not addressed in the Bible. Again, there's a whole world of planning and decision-making that we make in life where there isn't a book called um, The uh, uh, First Marriage or the book of careers. Uh, there's general principles and instruction that get us going on that, but the individual instruction that we're going to need is going to come by making Him, Jesus, our wonderful counselor in life on these issues, who to marry or not marry, what city to live in or to move to, what country to become a missionary to, uh, what career should I uh, pursue, so we receive all of this godly and good counsel from other people, and uh, now we see that uh, situation with a clarity that we've never had before, uh, but then now uh, we take that 
to the Lord in prayer and uh, uh, allow him to make the final decision. Uh, James says in James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God uh, who gives all, uh, to all liberally and without reproach, and it shall be given to him. What a tremendous resource in terms of wisdom for planning uh, is ours, and we access it uh, through prayer. And here's the promise that God makes, that if we come to him and ask for his wisdom uh, related to any plan that we have, that he is going to, uh, he, he is going to speak to us uh, about that plan. Uh, he is going to give us that wisdom that we need and the plans for the future. And so we submit our uh, activities and our plans to the Lord and His will. And when we do that, we just enjoy that absolute confidence uh, that His desire is going to be done uh, in this situation. His, he's going to give me this wisdom that, that I need, but I have to wait for it. Sometimes He's not in as big a hurry as, as we are. Uh, rarely is he in as big a hurry. Sometimes if he gave us his wisdom related to these kind of specifics that we ask of him in life, we are so impatient that if he's got us to the point that we're willing to pray and ask for his wisdom, he knows that if he gives us his wisdom, that we will assume that that also means this is the perfect timing to do this. And so we rush off and do it, and the timing is wrong because we never asked him about the timing. So I don't know how he deals with you, but I'm one of those people. So I find he will wait very often in my life until uh, the timing is perfect to reveal his plan because he knows I'm a type A and I'll go running off uh, to accomplish it. He knows who he's working with very, very well. And uh, in that, I'm speaking uh, of you. So, <laughs> Solomon makes the same promise on behalf of God. We saw it earlier in the series, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. and all of your ways, acknowledge Him. That's prayer. All of your ways, acknowledge Him. And then He will direct your paths. And so when Solomon calls on us to seek the wisdom of others in our planning and our decision making, he's not telling us to make decisions by committee. That's not what he's advocating here. He's advocating good, godly counsel and input related to our plans and then presenting those plans to God for the final say. Now remember that uh, these subjects that Solomon addresses in the book of Proverbs. They are not uh, uh, always intended to be exhaustive on any particular subject, um, but they are helpful. And so this morning, we're reminded of the importance of good, godly planning in life, the blessing of planning. And so we need to ask ourselves this morning in the privacy of our hearts, what areas in our lives might need some careful planning in or, that it's not receiving presently in order to reach the goals that we would like to reach in life. And, uh, and then to uh, plan and then to seek for that wisdom and then a plan for reaching that goal. And then of course, as God unfolds that plan, uh, to do that. And as we do that, then these massive blocks in our life now uh, it come out from under kind of the chaos and, and they're brought into order. So 80%, 90% of our life is settled now in terms of not needing daily attention uh, in, in our life. The plan is set, it's moving forward, we have the peace of God related to this, and now we can deal with that 10% of our life that does seem to be in play every single day. But if 100% of it is in play every day because of a lack of planning, it'll sink us. I don't care who we are, we will become that barking supervisor. Not only in the workplace, but at home. 
and in the marriage and in everywhere else in life. And we're frustrated with other people when the frustration can be a failure to plan on, on uh, our part. And, the, and frustration is not a life that God uh, has for us. And so as these things come out of the chaos, they come into order, and then God knows that we'll be able to, uh, that life will become uh, the blessing that He desires it to be uh, for our uh, lives. And so I was thinking about uh, what kind of is a word picture related to all of this. And, uh, and what happens when we plan, we have goals, and then we plan, and then we implement those plans in life. We move, uh, we move from trying to get a drink of water from the proverbial fire hose to now endeavoring to get a drink of water from a drinking fountain. And planning in life uh, makes all the difference, not only in getting a drink of water, but in the quality of life that we live. Let's stand together now and we'll close in prayer. Father, we know you well enough and we know your word well enough and we certainly see ourselves in your word uh, often enough as in all of the time that you don't waste your breath when you put things in your word and especially when you repeat things over and over and over again. And we know it's because when you look at us, even as your people, you see the terrible price that we pay in our lives for a failure to know your word and to obey your word. And so this morning we embrace again in the privacy of our own heart, your instruction and your counsel here related to planning, having goals that you set in our lives, having plans in our lives that makes life manageable and gives us a confidence and, and a fruitfulness and a blessing that we would never otherwise know. You see our hearts very, very clearly. You see where you want some of us not merely to hear today, but to implement certain things within our lives, to come in under the blessings of this wisdom. And I pray and we pray for one another that you would bring them into this place where their life moves from the chaos and the craziness and the wildness of, and the out of control of the failure to seek you and to plan and to have goals and bring them into the blessing of such a life. We pray for this work of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.